Hi, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, we're, needless to say, very excited to have our summit again. It's been a while. Um, I wanted to just start off by thanking everybody for being here, you who are attending and our presenters, and also to um, introduce or at least name our uh, core members of the Rondo Creek Watershed Alliance. Um, so that would be Eric Stewart. I guess, can they turn on their, um, their cameras or not, Monica? Absolutely. Okay. Can turn on the cameras whenever yeah. they want. So Eric Stewart is a core member. He's the one of the um, uh, town board member in, in the town of Rochester, uh, town of, oops, wrong town, town of Marbletown. Um, and uh, Andrew Faust, who's one of our core members and also one of our presenters tonight. Um, Tom Conrad was uh, at our uh, very first formulatory meeting. Um, uh, the, though he's presenting for the Mar Marbletown uh, Environmental Conservation Commission of which he's the chair. And Rebecca Martin, I don't think is joining us just yet who without her and River and Riverkeeper, we would probably not be in existence. And am I leaving anybody out? I don't think so. John Messerschmidt is around somewhere. Um, but he's not going to be presenting. So on that note, um, what I would like to do is um, introduce Emily Vale, who's the executive director of the Hudson River Watershed Alliance. Um, uh, and she's going to be doing the first presentation. The Hudson River Watershed Alliance is, is really the, like, I guess you call it the, 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 the mother of all of the watersheds in this area. And um, she's been doing really incredible work. So I'm very excited to hear what we have to, what she has to share tonight. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Emily. Great, thank you so much, Laura. And thanks to everyone who put on this event. It's really wonderful to be here with you in the Zoom room talking about the Roundout Creek tonight. So uh, if you can go ahead to the next slide. Uh, so as Laura mentioned, my name is Emily Vale. I'm the executive director of the Hudson River Watershed Alliance. And I was asked to talk about what's new in 22 at the Hudson River Watershed Alliance. If you go to the next slide. So I'll talk tonight about the Hudson River and its watershed and the Roundout Creek's place in that. And then talk about the Hudson River Watershed Alliance and what we do to support local watershed groups, improve intermunicipal coordination, and communicate as a collective voice, both what we've been doing and then some, some program areas that are new for us coming up in the next year. And then we'll talk a little bit about how to stay in touch. And this uh, beautiful great blue heron was in the Rondout Creek in Rosendale, and I had to pull over and take this picture because it was so beautiful. Uh, go ahead, next slide. So the Hudson River watershed extends from the Adirondacks, Lake Tier of the Clouds, all the way down to New York City. And a watershed is the land area from which water will flow to a particular body of water. So this map shows the three uh, largest portions of the Hudson River watershed. We've got the Upper Hudson uh, to the north in yellow, the Mohawk River watershed in blue in the west, and then below that the Hudson River estuary watershed in purple. And so all of this water that all of the rain, all the precipitation that lands in this, this land area will end up flowing to the Hudson River. And we know that that's a, a really large area. There's a lot of work to be done to protect clean water in this area. And that's really where our local partners come in. So the mission of the Hudson River Watershed Alliance is to unite and empower communities to protect their local water resources. And we work to bring local watershed groups together all across this region to share information, strategies, and, and work together towards the larger whole. So in this map, you can see many of the smaller watersheds that have active groups working to protect them. So go ahead for the next slide. So the Hudson River Watershed Alliance does three main things as an organization. We work to support watershed groups all across the Hudson River watershed, improve intermunicipal coordination because we know that watershed boundaries don't necessarily follow, follow political boundaries, and we work to communicate as a collective voice across the region on water issues. Go ahead for the next slide. So the first set of programs will be all about supporting local watershed groups. So next slide. So 
each year, we our biggest event is our annual Watershed Conference, which is actually coming up next week, October 25th through 28th, and is focused this year on watershed planning. We'll be providing case studies and tools, walking everyone through the watershed planning process from start to finish. So I'm going to actually drop a whole bunch of links into the chat uh, at the end of my talk with uh, more information about all of these programs. Um, but if you're interested in attending our annual Watershed Conference, that's next week with a different session each afternoon. Um, so our annual Watershed Conference is our biggest program where we can provide technical assistance, advice, and best practices to a, a broad audience around watershed work. Next slide. We also offer a regular breakfast lecture series. So this is the second Thursday of every month. And I know many of you that are on the Zoom today have participated in our breakfast lectures. Um, our, next month, we actually have it on the third Thursday, if you're paying attention, November 18th is not the second Thursday. Uh, the second Thursday will be Veterans Day, so we're honoring the holiday and postponing it a week. Um, but please join us for a special breakfast lecture with talks from Heather Bruegel from the Forge Project and, um, and Charlie Burgess from Open Space Institute on the Papskany Island land return. Um, which will be really exciting. If you are interested in looking at our back catalog of webinar recordings, those are all available on the Hudson River Watershed Alliance's YouTube channel. So this screenshot is from a talk from Brian Duffy from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation on stream biomonitoring and water quality assessments from the state. Uh, we have a lot of great uh, sort of a reference library of talks that are up on our YouTube channel. Next slide. We also hold watershed roundtables twice a year. This is an opportunity for members of watershed groups from all across the region to come together and share information with their peers. Uh, we love to hear updates. We love to hear success stories. Um, oftentimes there's strategies or questions or have you ever dealt with this difficult situation? Um, and so this is really one of the programs that's at the heart of the Hudson River Watershed Alliance where we're helping groups come together and learn from each other. Um, during the, the pandemic, we've been doing this virtually, which has actually been a great way to incorporate some folks that live a little bit further away and, and maybe reduce our collective carbon footprint while still making those connections. Next slide. We also provide workshops and trainings on a variety of different topics. Um, so this, is, this photo is from a science storytelling workshop that we held in the spring. Coming up in 2022, we'll be having a new webinar series on state resources for implementing best management practices and other projects to better connect people on the ground with state grants, technical assistance, and other opportunities to get support for the kinds of projects that you're, you're working on locally. And the Hudson River Watershed Alliance will also be doing a series of diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice workshops for watershed groups as well in 2022. So a couple of exciting new programs, and we'll be working on those in collaboration with the Hudson River Estuary Program as well. Next slide. Another exciting new program is uh, wa developing watershed characterizations. So this is a new program where we'll be working with um, two watersheds yet to be determined to develop templates for a watershed characterization. So this is the first the first step in the watershed planning process is to do an inventory of current conditions, looking at things like land use and land cover, which is what this map from the Monhagen Brook watershed is showing, um, but also things like water quality and other current information that's, that's already been collecting, collected and compiling it into a document that can easily be used to build a plan from there. So starting with what are our current conditions can help us identify what some gaps might be. And then once a group is ready to do a, a more robust plan, figuring out what the key actions are, what the real goals are, um, and who needs to be at the table to develop those strategies for next steps. So we're really excited about this. We'll be doing one urban and one rural watershed to develop these templates that we hope can be used by watersheds across the, the region. This will be a two year process. Um, again, inventorying existing information at a watershed scale. We'll be working with an advisory committee um, and more information on this to come. We're still rolling this out. You all might be the first to hear about it publicly, which is uh, really exciting, but but more to come. And we hope uh, you'll, you might be interested in that program. Next slide. Two minutes, Emily. Thank you. Uh, next slide. 
So in terms of improving intermunicipal coordination, there's a variety of programs that we do, but most relevant for the Rondell Creek watershed is that we applied for grant funding from the Hudson River Estuary Program this year in partnership with the Peace University Land Use Law Center to bring a Land Use Leadership Alliance training to the Rondout and Osopus Creek watershed. So we haven't heard yet if this, we were successful. I think many of you uh, on the call tonight on the, in the Zoom provided a letter of support and we're, we're really grateful for that. Um, so if we are awarded this grant, the Hudson River Watershed Alliance and Peace Land Use Law Center will be bringing this award-winning land use training to the municipalities and communities in the Osopus Creek and Rondout Creek watersheds. So fingers crossed and more to come. Next slide. Next slide. So in terms of communicating as a collective voice, one of the big projects that we've been working on is a needs assessment. We had 32 interviews with watershed group leaders and four focus groups to bring in perspectives of regional partners on what are the needs around watershed work in the Hudson River watershed. And we heard uh, strengths and success stories. We heard about challenges and barriers. And I've been working on analyzing all of the information that we collected, which was a really Lots, lots of information, very rich information. Uh, and I will be finishing out the final report this fall, which will then be publicly available. So the needs assessment work is feeding into strategic planning at the Hudson River Watershed Alliance, where we're asking how can we best meet the needs of our local watershed groups and our local watershed partners. Um, so again, more to come once that report comes out. And we think that it will also be very useful for our local partners in securing grant funds and, and justifying some of the needs that we heard across many groups in the region. Next slide. The Hudson River Watershed Alliance also serves as a liaison for local and regional projects. And in the past year, we worked to submit collective comments on the Hudson River Estuary Program's accident agenda on behalf of watershed groups. Um, it's, it's a kind of role that we can play to be that liaison between state and regional projects and more local groups uh, to make sure that 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 everyone's coordinating as best we can. I also wanted to mention our work on watersheds report, which I have a copy of right here. Um, if you don't have a copy and you'd like one, please let me know. I'd be happy to mail you a copy, but I'll also put a link to the PDF in the chat. This is a summary of success stories from watershed groups across the region, showing the diversity of different types of projects that groups are working on and the ways that watershed groups are having a real impact. So there's a nice um, feature on the Rondout Creek Watershed Alliance uh, in particular, and uh, we hope you'll take a look at that. Next slide. So if you're interested in staying in touch with the Hudson River Watershed Alliance. Uh, we encourage you to attend our upcoming programs. We try to have a, a variety of different types of programs. You can subscribe to our monthly email newsletter. I'll put the link in the chat. Follow us on social media, which is another way that we serve as a collective voice to share information. And really, I, I encourage you all to get involved with the Rondell Creek Watershed Alliance because the Hudson River Watershed Alliance does work across the region. Uh, we're a very small organization. I am the executive director and only staff person. And the way that we're able to have such an impact is by having really wonderful groups on the ground like the Rondell Creek Watershed Alliance that are bringing together people that are doing this important work, that are coordinating with municipalities and so on. So um, people often ask how they can get involved with the Hudson River Watershed Alliance. And really, we encourage you to you know, attend our programs, find out about these opportunities, but certainly get involved with the Rondout Creek Watershed Alliance to make a, a real difference at, at the local scale. I think that's next slide. Great. That's, that's it from me. I'm going to copy and paste those resources that I mentioned and put them right in the chat. So you have them. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Emily. That was awesome. If you'd like a copy of the work on watersheds report, uh, make sure you send me your address or um, you, the link to get the PDF copy is above as well in the chat.
Emily, is there anything that you didn't mention in your presentation that if you that was like the slide that got cut that you want to to mention while we have a minute while we give folks a chance to ask any questions? Sure. Yeah. So I think um, it's a really exciting time to be in watershed work, um, and I I'm really looking forward to our annual watershed conference on watershed planning. Uh, we've got a lot of information and and opportunities coming down around climate change and flooding, source water protection, and we're going to feature uh, presentations on those topics at the conference. So um, if folks have questions about those state programs, um, it'll be great to, to come to the conference. Um, and as we're building out the um, these watershed characterizations and working on the needs assessment, one of the things that we're really hearing is that um, strategic planning is really important as well. So we're thinking about watershed planning, not only looking at on the ground conditions of water quality, but also thinking about flood conditions and thinking about climate change resilience. How can we be looking at a watershed scale to really be considering what the whole system is going to be looking like rather than just one particular site? And then also broadening that out to strategic planning for watershed groups. So um, having clear, um, you know, maybe it's a work plan, maybe it's goals that are oriented to build partnerships, maybe there are opportunities to build capacity. Um, so we're working on feeding some of those concepts in as we think about watershed planning from a more holistic perspective. Um, okay, Lola, I got your address. And Anne, I need your address for a work on watershed report. Well, Emily, I am signed up for a variety of sessions and having gone to the conference in years past, I can definitely vouch for it. So if you are on the fence, it's definitely worth the time and it's a really wonderful combination of learning and then also really actionable um, items that you can potentially implement with your own community organization. So I think that I haven't seen any questions pop in, but the good thing is, is we know how to get in touch with Emily. Um, and if you don't, for whatever reason, you can be in touch with Riverkeeper um, or the Rhonda Creek Watershed Alliance, and we can put you directly in touch with Emily. So I think that we are going to be turning things over to Eric and Tom and John. Hi, uh, I'm Eric Stewart, and I serve on the town board of the town of Marbletown. I've been there for four years, uh, but I've been a member of the Marbletown ECC for considerably longer than that. In fact, I joined um, right after Tom did. And um, I'm before I introduce Tom and all the great work that he's done, I just wanted to kind of very quickly um, go over some of the things that the ECC has been involved with um, for the last few years. Um, a lot of this is focused on renewable energy. Uh, we took a census of the streetlights in our town and converted, got rid of some and converted the rest to LEDs. Um, we've installed electric vehicle chargers. Uh, we have promoted uh, solar energy. And in fact, there's a solar farm that is being installed even as we speak now in 209. Um, and most, we also have recently passed a stretch code which strengthens building codes in town. Um, as what these, as it relates to the Rondock Creek in general, um, we have done a couple of projects and I think there might be a slide here. Yes, excellent, thank you. Um, this shows Grady Park in High Falls. Those of you who are familiar with the Hamlet of High Falls, um, probably knows where the, you probably know where the uh, flea market is. Grady Park is that kind of vacant lot, uh, section of land that includes um, the flea market site. And this is a project that the town has been working on for several years. Um, we've had some great partnerships with the High Falls Conservancy and also with the DNH Canal Society. And we've hired a um, professional planning firm uh, and engineering firm to create this design. Um, the top slide shows the outline of the park itself. And the second slide shows that little red line that runs through the park shows uh, this ADA compliant walkway um, that runs the length of the park. Um, in addition to providing like a, a lovely green space, um, the town views this 
project as a um, as a gateway, really, to the town of Marble Town, and it also will serve as a nexus for our uh, ONW Rail Trail network. Uh, included as related projects to the park would be the Conservancy, the ONW and Conservancy Creek Walk, which runs along the banks of the Roundout itself below the falls in High Falls. And this would also coordinate with the many projects that the DNH Canal Society is working on, which includes uh, their new visitor center, which is currently um, under construction, and as well as their five locks walk and uh, a loop that eventually will run through High Falls. So the town views this as a really you know, exciting project. And as this relates to Roundup Creek Watershed Alliance and Riverkeeper, um, as part of this project, we, you know, protecting the, the Ronda is, is, was a key element of this design. And we worked with those two groups to do water testing um, along not only the Ronda itself, but also the tributaries that feed into it. And luckily we found out that there were not um, any significant problems as far as, um, you know, leaks from septic systems or anything like that. But um, unfortunately, the, the bacterial counts in the Rondout are high, um, high enough that we recommend people do not go swimming. Um, but this is, for, the bacteria comes from geese and from agricultural runoff. Um, but it is very important to the town that, you know, we keep access to the creek for um, fishing and for boating and kayaking and those sort of things. And so um, the Rondo Creek Watershed Alliance and Riverkeeper was really instrumental in helping us with that project. And now we have another slide, please. The another, we've, we've also done several projects um, working with the Trees for Tribs program. Um, several years ago, uh, Trees for Tribs um, planted more than 600 uh, native trees uh, along the banks of the Coxingkill, uh, which is a tributary of the Rondout in the town of Rochester. And the Rondout Creek Watershed Alliance, um, working in conjunction with uh, the town of Rochester's uh, ECC, um, went to the Coxingkill on several different occasions. And um, what we were doing is we were removing these leather, uh, these um, plastic sheaths, which you can see in that one photograph. Uh, these plastic sheaths were placed around the trees when they were planted to protect them from browsing by deer and other critters. Um, but as the trees matured, you know, those had to be removed. And so, uh, like I said, we went there several times and um, it was re really a great uh, experience. And you can see from these pictures that some of these, one of at least one of these uh, um, projects took place uh, during the very height of the pandemic. And so you can see how we were all wearing um, masks and, and practicing social distancing. Um, there's probably a lot of pictures of folks there that you might recognize, um, it'd be easier if they weren't wearing masks, but um, one of our guests who just happened to stop by um, was um, our county executive, uh, Pat Ryan, who you can see standing up there um, next to Andrew and, and Laura and, and, and Andrew's lovely daughter. So anyway, that was just kind of a fun thing. But um, thanks to Trees for Tribs and, and working with them, uh, we were able to, you know, to uh, come to the rescue of, of those 600 trees. So that just kind of gives you a, some of the things, some of, um, some of the, pro gives you an idea of some of the projects that we've been working on. And now it is my pleasure to turn it over to Tom Conrad. And uh, many thanks to him for his great leadership. Great. Three more minutes. Uh, um, so while Eric's been working on the Grady Park and Watershed thing, I've been focusing Marble Towns on efforts um, on Marble Towns 100% Renewable Action Plan, which is a plan for transitioning the entire town from uh, to renewable energy, including uh, the residents. And to get the residents, we have a 10-step um, planning program to help people plan their own transition so that when they, uh, when something comes up for repair, like their boiler or their car, they know what they need to buy and they don't end up just buying a fossil fuel appliance. So the, the blue thing there is sort of an outline of the 10-step. We're launching 
for expanding a pledge program um, where you, you go through the 10 steps, you build your plan, you pledge to follow the plan. We have lawns, we'll have lawn signs that will have put people out and to uh, encourage people to take uh, the pledge and to advertise that a lot of people are doing this. We are going to ask people to put the lawn sign in front of their house, take a picture of it, put it on social media, and those people are gonna vote um, on someone to get in Marble Town to get a free um, electric vehicle, vehicle charger install. Um, next slide, please. Oh. Um, we were a little distracted this year from that um, because of the new most recent round of the Climate Smart, uh, actually that was Clean Energy Communities, my typo, Clean Energy Communities Leadership Round of Grants. Uh, we decided to go for that and managed to get $35,000 worth of grants by completing their actions. We'll be using those to buy a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle for our building department and electric yard and lawn equipment for a new town maintenance department. Um, we would have actually, we almost got to the, the biggest $70,000 grant, um, but they went away before we got there because we were relying on a new opt-out community solar program, which will be starting um, in December. Uh, we thought it would start this summer, which automatically will sign up all town residents for community solar and save them money on their electric bills. Next slide, please. Um, we have a series of workshops that we've been doing to help people to help people on that 10 step program. Um, I know I'm cutting into John's time. So I'll just say that our next workshop is on November 17th with a uh, local Roundout uh, Creek uh, person, Jen Metzger on Green the Grid and Electrify Everything, which is what the town, the um, state needs to do to uh, accomplish the Climate Leadership and uh, Community Protection Act goals that were passed. Um, you have a, a little bit of extra time, Tom, if you need. Okay. Yeah. It seems like we're running behind. Um, but um, yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I rushed myself and then I'm not. Um, but uh, so anyone can do our pledge and 10 step goals. I actually had a presentation on that scheduled yesterday as part of Sustainable Hudson Valley's Climate Solutions Week, um, which didn't happen. And so if one of the organizations on this group wants to get together and sponsor the next version of that presentation that didn't happen yesterday, um, We'll work with them. It would be great to have some more turnout for that. And again, that'll help individuals um, plan their own transitions to 100% renewable energy. If so if you wanna find out more about that and how the pledge works. Um, the pledge is open to anyone outside Marble Town. We'll only be giving away the EV charger to Marble Town resident, uh, Marble Town resident or business. But um, if you participate, you'll have a vote on who actually gets it. And I'll pass over to Tom Messerschmidt, um, who is going from uh, Rochester. Is he here? Um, John, mainly the no. ECC and the, do you want, where are you, John? Not here. Okay. Um, the, the ECC in the town of Rochester has been focusing a lot on third Thursdays where they've been doing a variety of different kinds of presentations. They've been on hold um, for the summer and everything's been on Zoom, but they also have a Facebook page and sent and an email um, address to, if you wanna get on their mailing list to find out what events are, are going to be coming up. Um, so uh, our next person is, um, Tom, our wonderful member, Tom, he is a member. He hasn't exactly um, said he's a core member yet, um, but Tom works for the, is the water resource specialist at the Hudson River Estuary Program. And um, he is going to be doing his presentation on um, stream conditions and indexes in the work that the Estuary Program is doing um, right now. So uh, it's all yours, Tom. Thank you for the introduction, Laura. Uh, next slide, please. 
So I'm Tom McCrevish, like Laura said, I'm the water resource specialist for the Hudson River Estuary Program with a partnership with uh, Cornell Water Resource Institute. And today I'll be talking about the Stream Condition Index tool. Uh, next slide. I'm just gonna give a quick overview of the Hudson River Estuary Program. So our program, as Emily uh, said earlier, we offer a variety of grants as well as technical assistance, um, education resources, um, and as uh, Eric also said, the Trees for Trips program, shout out to Beth Wessler. She's the coordinator, she's awesome. Um, but our program uh, sets to work to achieve key benefits. As you can see here on the slide, we have clean water, resilient communities, vital estuary ecosystems, fish, wildlife, and habitat, natural scenery, education, access, recreation, and of course, inspiration. Um, and our program is guided by our action agenda, which, get, which gets updated every five years. Uh, we just went through a, a comment, a public comment period uh, a few months ago. So we're looking on finalizing everything and hopefully um, have a final version uh, in the near future. And on the right picture here is our program and uh, our, our, our program boundary. And it's in the, the blue highlight there. Um, and we encompass around 13 counties. Uh, next slide, please. So a little background on the stream condition index tool. Um, it helps identify the quality of streams. So this was created by the estuary program through an initiative um, through the uh, 2012 document, EPA Identifying and Protecting Healthy Watersheds. Uh, this was created by our program with help um, from the New York State DEC Division of Water, uh, the Water Resource Institute at Cornell University, um, as well as the National Heritage Program, as well as other entities that I'll probably go over um, later in the, uh, the talk. Um, and so uh, also another thing to note, which I will be um, hinting on in, uh, later in the, uh, the talk is that uh, this tool would be benefit from additional scientific rigor um, as this model is um, just information based. So next slide, please. So I just wanted to give a, a quick background on the EPA document I um, mentioned. Um, so basi basically um, this document is saying um, what are the benefits of small investments in uh, healthy water bodies compared to um, impaired water bodies. And so they list the benefits of protection and the assessment components to figure out um, if your water body is healthy. So landscape condition, habitat, hydrology, as you can read the rest there. Um, and they also hint on management approaches. Um, and I did also want to um, mention that the EPA has a healthy watershed protection program, which is where I believe I got this document from. Um, and they have other resources uh, surrounding healthy water bodies and watersheds that are uh, really interesting. So the link's there at the bottom. Uh, next slide, please. So a little bit of breakdown on what I'm going to be talking about with the Stream Condition Index tool. Um, as you can see, it was ArcGIS based um, and the whole tool includes eight metrics to uh, fully identify um, low to high quality streams uh, in the estuary. Um, and so there's a list, we got natural cover, agricultural cover, impervious cover, brook trout habitat su suitability, hydrological alteration, um, habitat connectivity, BAP score and geomorphological restraint. Next slide. So a little overview on the natural cover. It's taken from the 2011 National Land Cover data set. I'm not gonna go through all of the, what it includes, uh, but I, I did wanna put it on the slide so everyone can get like a broad sense of what this um, data set actually includes and what is captured in this tool. Um, next slide. So agriculture and impervious cover, these are both separate, but I decided to combine them in, in one slide to limit, uh, let me select slides. Um, so agriculture, it's the percent of the agriculture cover um, captured in a 200 meter buffer uh, from the streams. Um, and then the same thing for impervious cover, um, except it, it calculates um, and takes into account roadways, sidewalk, bridges, any anthropogenic features. Uh, next slide. Brook trout habitat su suitability. So this is a predicted category um, of brook trout in, in, in the stream segments, their habitat. Um, and this was actually, I think, conducted in the, the early to mid 2000s, USGS went out to water bodies in New York State, um, sampled for brook trout, and then they developed a, um, a model, the, the trout habitat suitability model, and um, 
that models the abundance and distribution of the lotic habitat of the brook trout. So that is actually used in the stream condition index tool. Um, next slide. So hydrological alteration. So this is all the dam data. Um, so New York State DEC has dam data. It's uh, available through uh, Google Earth. Um, they have a series of um, uh, guidelines on how to get that data and what to do in order to see that data. Um, but basically this tool takes the dam, de dam density uh, in a sub watershed um, level. Um, next slide. So habitat connectivity, a little bit related to the dam data. Um, it basically assesses the distances between the physical barriers, whether these could be culverts or dams or culverts on culverts or dams on dams. Um, and so the Nature Conservancy uh, created this barrier analysis tool, which is, which is a GIS add-on. Um, so um, we we're able to capture that and, and incorporate that in, the, in, our, uh, in our tool. Uh, next slide. So BAP score, it's a, the biological assessment profile. Um, now this was taken from biomonitoring data from New York State uh, Division of Water uh, staff. And if you don't know what biomonitoring data is, it's basically collecting macroinvertebrates. And if you don't know that, those are small bugs in the stream. And depending on what you gather, what types of bugs, certain bugs thrive in impaired water bodies where um, other bugs uh, cannot, they need very uh, rich environments. They can get, you can get a pretty good indication on what the stream health is based off those bugs. So division of water um, has a um, mechanism in a way to combine all that macroinvertebrate data and include it into a BAP score. And you can see on this bottom picture here, they uh, created a scoring system. Um, so the biological impairment threshold is five. So if you're below it, that's that's not good. You don't want to be there. It's, that's not very, uh, it, that indicator is not a healthy stream. And anything above the five is, is good. Um, but uh, the National Heritage Program uh, modeled all the, um, the BAPs that were um, acquired by Division of Water. Next slide. So geomorpho uh, geomorphological restraint. Um, so this, uh, this parameter captures the density of roads and railroads. Um, within 50 meters of each stream segment, in addition to rails and um, railroads and roads uh, with stream crossings, because some roads have stream crossings and culverts, and railroads sometimes go over small streams. Um, so um, that is the last parameter for the um, stream condition index. So next slide. So I'll be going over a quick breakdown of the scoring. Next slide. So. Each of the eight metrics that I discussed, they have a standardized scoring from zero to four, zero being the worst and four being the best. In total, in the whole Hudson River estuary, there are 38,888 stream segments that were individually scored. So to get a um, individual stream segment score, you have to take the sum of all the metrics um, and then divide them by eight. And then that's how you get the stream segment score. And then here at the bottom is just a range of how we score them. So any from a stream segment that scores between zero to 2.4 mine, that's the lowest. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but anything from 3.5 to four, that's the highest condition. And so there's different um, guidelines and characteristics to distinguish um, the, the, the stream health. Next slide. So I pulled up the Rondout Creek watershed here on the right, um, highlighted in blue. And so this is the, the low condition stream segments are highlighted in green or green line and the average are yellow. Uh, purple is high condition and the red is the highest condition. So there's a total of 1,533 stream segments that were scored in the Rondout Creek watershed. Um, and the most were high condition. So yeah, that, that's good, right? Um, followed by average and then the highest condition and then you only uh there's only 87 uh low condition uh streams so overall it seems like it's um from this tool it, it seems like there's a good majority of high high condition and um average condition streams next slide so you might be asking how how can we use this tool um well first i like to just go right off the bat and say the eight um indicators and parameters i discussed um, to evaluate stream health, maybe, you know, somebody that's looking to evaluate stream health wasn't really looking maybe at, you know, um, land cover or macroinvertebrates or even brook trout habitats. 
So it just gives you a broader mind of really what to look out for. Um, this tool is strictly information uh, basis and does not have actual and in, in, in real data, real time data. Um, so um, this would be good for using for land acquisition, uh, local land use decision making policies, um, as well as uh, you know trying to identify a place to research and sample. Um, this tool can also kind of give you an idea of the watershed health um, and the whole addition going back to the EPA um, healthy watersheds um, uh, program that I mentioned earlier, identifying the healthy streams and trying to maintain that status. Because uh, if you think about it, yes, you know, we want to focus on impaired water bodies, but if we don't like focus or, or put at least a little an, a, a keen eye on the healthy um, water bodies and, and watersheds, uh, with due time, possibly they could be impaired. So it's that balance that it's a very hard balance to take, but I feel like we should focus a little bit more on the healthier uh, watersheds and water bodies. Um, and uh, next slide. For a minute, Thomas, then time for questions. Okay, great. So you might be asking yourself, where can this be accessed? Well, um, in 2019, it was put, put up on the Hudson Valley Natural Resource Mapper. Um, I put the link down in the bottom of the slide. So when you click on that link, if you look at the top hand picture here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, um, but it comes up with a little uh, data viewer on the right hand side. And then in the left box, there's a series of layers, sub layers. So you're gonna, to get to the stream condition index layer, you're gonna go down to the stream and watershed layer. I know it's probably very hard to see. And then once you click on that toolbar, the stream and the index tool will be further down. And so it's a little checkbox and you click it and you have to zoom in a considerable amount. So if you click on it and, and nothing's showing besides that the blue uh, boundary line, uh, you have to zoom in more. Um, so once you zoom in more, uh, this bottom picture snip right here in the slide, um, you can see the little uh, little sign of Accord there with uh, stream segments. So I just emulated, I clicked on a stream segment, um, that's the, the Roundout Creek flowing through Accord, um, and it highlights it in teal blue, the, the um, segment that I clicked on. And so it comes up with all the, um, the ratings that the scoring metrics that I had discussed, um, as well as what the condition is, so high condition, and then the index rating 3.125, because remember those ratings, that would make it a high condition rate. Um, and then there's also other um, aspects to it calculates the length and the, the catchment area, um, as well as other things. Um, and so I believe that is it. Um, next slide. And so that's my contact information. Um, and so this will be recorded so you can jot it down. You don't, I don't feel like you have to jot it down right away. But uh, uh, if there's any questions um, after this webinar, um, I'm sure that um, Riverkeeper will forward them to me. Or if you want to contact me directly, uh, feel free to do so. Thank you. Tom, is there anything that you didn't get to say in the main body of your presentation that you feel excited to mention while folks think of questions? Yeah, so um, thank you for saying that. Um, so I'm in the midst of updating this stream condition index tool model. Um, because I believe it's been a, a few years, but the um, like I mentioned with the um, Hudson Valley Natural Resource Mapper, it's still up. People can still um, you know uh, play around with it, figure out which um, you know uh, stream segments are healthy or whatnot. But I am in the midst of of trying to update um, as layers um, are somewhat out of date compared to right now. So. Um, only, may, may, uh, so basically the whole point of the stream condition index tool is to focus on the healthy watersheds because everyone knows about paired watersheds and water bodies, but um, just trying to maintain the statuses of a healthy water, uh, water body is really, um, is really key. Yeah, that does seem important because you also don't want them to slip on, onto the other map. So we also have to definitely keep up keep an eye on the healthier ones. Thank you for sharing that. We actually do have a question popped in. And the question is, how do you determine brook trout suitable habitat? 
Yeah, so I don't know how much I can talk to that as it was taken from USGS. They did most of the sampling and then they, they created a model off of that. Um, I'm assuming um, there's a variety of ways you, you probably can survey. I know that uh, our fisheries um, in the Hudson River estuary, they do a lot of uh, electro fishing, which is basically uh, giving the fish a friendly shock and uh, temporarily uh, paralyzing them so they could uh, capture um, samples. But I'm not sure exactly um, based off of USGS how they, what they do and what their, um, their methods are, but that, that could be um, something. Thank you. We have a second question that came in through the chat box and it says, Tom, this appears to be a user friendly tool and hence it doesn't take a great amount of skill to interact with it. But is there any kind of training or certification program that folks could take to develop a deeper familiarity and userability with it? As of right now, there is no uh training or certification or anything like that. But if people are having trouble, um, they could most certainly reach out to me or our program and, and we could uh, assist them uh, if needed. Thank you. And we had another question pop in and it is, is the Rondau safe for swimming now? If that feels like something that you want to pass on to potentially some of our panelists talking about sewage or they can build off, um, off your response, we can definitely go that way. Yeah, I can't really say too much about that as our tool doesn't evaluate swimming parameters. Um, but if anybody else has, um, is, any of the other panelists have anything to say about that, um, they, they can, but I, I, I don't have anything to say uh, for that, the tool. That is so fun. Thank you. Yeah, so for uh, the asker of that question and anyone else that feels curious about water quality in the Rondo Creek watershed, um, my colleagues, Jen Epstein and Sebastian Pelletier are actually going to be talking about it um, right now, probably at this minute. Um, but we're gonna to do the last question uh, for Tom before we move um, to Jen and Sebastian. And that question is, when do you expect the tool to be updated, if you have a sense? I would probably say the tool to be updated sometime next year. Um, as it's a pretty complex tool and behind the scenes. Uh, so there's a lot of things that, that need to get done and orchestrate with uh, um, the right people on the, the uh, you know, the, the masterminds behind the GIS data. <laughs> as I know some, but I, I'm not one that knows all, so. <laughs> I was going to say, as someone who has a very, very small amount of GIS knowledge, I definitely um, understand and, and appreciate uh, the people behind the curtain that make the data accessible and GIS so interactable for the public. So thank you so much to everyone who put questions forward for Thomas and also Thomas for your presentation. Um, and we can go on to water quality in the Rondo Creek watershed and ideas for septic system management with Jen Epstein and Sebastian Pelletieri of Riverkeeper. Then, um, hi everyone, I'm happy to be at uh, Roundout Watershed Summit. Um, I wanna congratulate the Roundout Creek Watershed Alliance for continuing to meet and work through this global pandemic and for putting on this event tonight. I'm presenting with Sebastian Pilateri, my colleague, as Jen said, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and our work represents the collaborative efforts of many people, including many people here. Uh, next slide, please. Riverkeeper began testing the water in the Rondo Creek in 2012. Um, our sampling program is a community science program, meaning that community members volunteer to collect samples. We analyze them in our lab and we prioritize sharing what we learn, um, sharing the data with communities in the watershed, such as this one, and working with them to respond to the data. In the Rondo Creek watershed, um, ECCs have played a big role in sampling, continue to play a big role, and Sebastian and I wanted to use this opportunity to acknowledge and thank them for their time and consistent dedication, as well as High Falls Conservancy. Um, our water sampling program is focused on Enterococcus bacteria, which we nickname Entero. 
Uh, entro is a group of bacteria that indicate the presence of human or animal waste in the water. It, um, in excess, um, Enterococcus, or animal or human waste in excess is what we call fecal contamination. And especially when fecal contamination is human in origin, it's a health risk for people who swim or play or paddle in the water, anything where you're likely to get water in your mouth um, and ingest it. So, you know, it goes without saying in this river, people like to get in the water. Next slide, please. Um, so assessing the swimmability is important and EPA recommends using Enterococcus bacteria to identify fecal contamination. EPA has used epidemiological studies of beach swimmers to derive numerical thresholds that indicate elevated health risk. In this pie chart, we're looking at all of the individual samples that we've collected in the Rondout Creek from 2012 to 2020. And the red section represents the portion of samples that have exceeded EPA's recommended threshold for safe swimming, meaning that those samples indicated water conditions unsafe for swimming. Whoever asked that question, this is <laughs> the answer to your question. The green section is the portion of single samples that have shown conditions to be unsafe for swimming or less safe for swimming. So as you can see in the Rundet watershed, about three quarters of the times that we have gone out to collect samples, um, they have been above EPA's recommended threshold. So if you imagine that those sampling trips were swimming trips, about three quarters of the time, uh, whoever's collecting that sample, you know, say they're swimming, they would have been at increased risk of illness. Next slide, please. One of the complexities of fecal contamination is that there are multiple potential sources of Enterococcus bacteria, and not all the sources represent equal levels of risk. So as I mentioned before, human sources are the biggest priority because they are the greatest risk. When we see elevated levels of Enterococcus, our next question is, where is it coming from? Um, there are many methods for source tracking and the best approach is to use a combination of different methods. Um, in the Roundout Watershed, we've done several different projects over the years. And next slide, I'd like to highlight two whose outcomes point us toward the importance of septic systems in this watershed. The first project is micro microbial source tracking work that we did with Cornell University in 2017. Microbial source tracking involves using DNA to look for specific target sources of fecal contamination. In our roundout study, we looked specifically for human, bird, cow, and horse. Bird was the most common marker. So we know that bird contamination is something we need to keep in mind when we are thinking about the Rondout Creek story. Human marker was the next most common and those two left cow and horse very far behind. So I think it's really fair to talk about those two. We detected human fecal associated DNA at seven of our eight sampling sites. At six of them, the marker was really infrequently present. So our study showed that human contamination uh, was widespread in the watershed, but not consistently present at most of the sites. This could be taken to mean that the sources are low in volume um, or intermittent, or that they're older material. Um, the second project, next slide, was a GIS mapping project that we did with Waterkeeper Alliance, looking at lots of different map layers in detail, site by site. The big takeaway from this work was that Rondo watershed soils are not well suited for septic system leach fields. We hear a lot of anecdotal evidence about septic systems that are old, close to the water, not sure where they are on the property. These are anecdotes, but um, they're fairly common, so they take on some weight. And it's also true that there are a couple of dozen large septic systems in the watershed. These are like institutional scale septic systems, not individual homes. These are subject to state oversight and enforcement through the Speedy's permitting program, which is the same program that covers wastewater treatment plants. Um, but the types of permits that these septics have are fairly lax with their monitoring and reporting requirements. Sometimes these places only have to report once per year. Um, 
And it's difficult to initiate inspections and enforcement at these places when problems do crop up. And then the enforcement is slow when it happens. I mean, these are just little fish in a big pond full of many wastewater treatment plants. Um, just one minor note on High Falls. We did the DNA testing. Um, we didn't do any DNA testing right within the High Falls area. It's definitely true that the Runout Creek's water quality problems don't start at High Falls. But when we did our focus study there, we did see water quality getting worse through the hamlet. Um, so it's true that non-human sources are likely to be in the mix there, but unfortunately, we don't have any direct assessment of human contamination presence there. And there's more that we need to understand about where the septic systems are in the hamlet um, and how the groundwater moves through that area, I think, um, to make really definitive conclusions. Um, one thing that's true about septics is that there are a lot of things that local municipalities um, and local intermunicipal groups can do to really systematically and proactively address problems and protect water quality. And Sebastian is going to take it from here and get into those. One more minute, you guys, then time for questions. Word. Hey, everyone. Good evening. Um, thanks, Jen, for laying that out so clearly. Um, so we have septic systems that might be failing. Now what do we do? Um, and so what we need to do really is uh, understand that kind of where we're at now is we have science to understand the issues that we have in the Rondell Creek, but now we need to put into practice policies and politics in order to improve those conditions. And so there are a lot of different management policies that we can go into. But in this, we're just gonna talk about three real quick that go from kind of ease of implementation to the most complex implementation that all have examples within New York State. So we can go to the next slide. So the first program is a municipal inspection uh, at the point of sale of a home before the transference of a deed. And so what this program is, is that in Queensbury and Bolton, which are two communities around Lake George, they were having issues with water quality that was impacting their drinking water sources, their wells that are influenced by the lake. And so they put into practice this type of a program that required the inspection before the transference of a deed. Um, this is handled through the Building Codes Enforcement Office. And before that inspection takes place, you need to have a pump out of the septic system, which is an inspection, which is what this person I believe in the photo is doing. And then after those things happen, it can be inspected. And if it passes inspection, then a letter can be issued. Uh, and the deed can be transferred. And so the benefit of doing it at this phase in a process is that uh, people have access to funds when a home is being sold. So if there are potential repairs that need to happen, a person is able to access funds in order to make that happen. And you're not buying a bunch of problems when you're purchasing a home. And so as of 2019, December 2019, after one year of this program in Queensbury, of the 43 citizens that were inspected there, 25 needed to be or rather failed, um, but not all the repairs were super expensive, right? They can come out cost, uh, one of them in one case, it was just like $10 to fix a part. Uh, we can move to the next slide now. And so kind of one step up maybe from uh, municipal and re municipalities requiring inspection to the point of sale would be uh, sanitary sewer districts, which can allow for municipal oversight of septic systems. And so what this is, is this is a photo of, of Woodstock, which has this program in place. And so New York state law allows for municipalities to form sanitary sewer districts uh, that can cover the management of septic systems. Uh, septic districts operate on a dues system that will provide funding for inspections and routine maintenance like pump outs. Uh, types of services that can be provided through these districts can vary based upon the dues um, that are collected. And these kinds of districts can be really effective. And so the stats we do have from an example in, in Otter Tail Lake in Minnesota was that during the initial years of the program, out of the 1,600 systems that fell underneath the district, half needed to be upgraded and replaced. Um, and then in the 10 years, so from 2005 to 2015, the most recent year since the study was published, only 17 systems needed to be replaced. So that's just saying, once you start one of these programs, there can be a lot of issues that you start to find in terms of septic systems. But once these programs are going, it's a lot easier because your systems have been inspected regularly and they've been maintained. We can move to the next slide now too. 
And then now kind of like taking this up one scale further is looking at it on a intermunicipal level. Uh, and so we have this example, this wonderful example from the Finger Lakes. This is the Cuca Watershed Improvement Cooperative. And this is a watershed management council that's implemented practices uh, to contribute to septic management out in Cuca Lake. And so this is a cooperative that eight municipalities formed out there and they all use Cuca Lake for drinking water. And so what they have is basically a watershed manager that they've hired that serves a cooperative in the member municipalities. The cooperative is supported by an annual due system um, that is set by the board of directors and the board of directors is made up of representatives from the eight communities. Each municipality is in charge of hiring their own watershed inspector, inspector who conducts septic evaluations, site inspections, monitor systems every five years, uh, and focuses on those that are within 200 feet of a water body. So it's a geographic focus on this. Um, they inspect about 3,000 systems every year. Um, and the inspections require pump outs, flow tests, um, kind of those routine maintenance things that are, that are important for septic systems. Uh, these cooperatives, they also kind of encompass the um, Queensbury and Bolton example, where they also do require uh, the notification of a transference of property or sale, and inspection must happen, I think it's 10 days prior to the closing. Uh, and this is really effective because you're operating at a watershed scale. And so you're stopping, um, you're developing septic ordinances and septic policies at a watershed scale to manage a water body collectively. It's a really great example from the Finger Lakes. Um, and so again, we tried to cover these uh, in order quickly and in order from kind of the easiest to the most complex. Um, and this is a new area of exploration for us and we welcome the chance to collaborate with anyone who's looking to learn more, or better understand these types of septic management. Uh, and I'll stop for questions. Thank you. So it looks like we have two questions. One is how is the water in the Rondo Creek and is it safe for swimming? We can start there. You want me to go? Kind of. I love these questions because it, it's really like, you know, the question of now, is the Rondo Creek safe for swimming now? And it's one of those right. issues we come across where we can't monitor real-time conditions, but I love the, the enthusiasm behind the question, but you can go ahead, Jen. So from the data we've gathered, we can say it's probably safe for swimming about a quarter of the time, but it really depends on site by site as well. And mm -hmm. so that pie chart that I showed was uh, an agglomeration of all the data, but you can go in and look at the individual sampling sites and see that there are some areas that do better than others. Mm -hmm. And I, that reminds me, I have a bunch of links I'm going to drop in here, one of which is to uh, the data. And as Jen mentioned too during her presentation, you know, it's based on this EPA study that was looking at illness rates. And so what they saw was above the threshold, I think it was like 32 out of 1,000 people were hospitalized for a gastrointestinal illness. So it's to say that there's a level of kind of like risk tolerance that's involved with it as well. It's not like a guarantee if, if the water's, you know, we have a red light or a red green light system on our website. It's not to say that if that's red, you're necessarily gonna get sick or if it's green, you're gonna be okay. It is to say there's an increased probability of risk if you go swimming in an area that has higher uh, geometric mean or more samples that are above that threshold. Yeah, thanks, that's a great point. No, you mentioned it during your presentation. <laughs> no, you did. Super helpful. Um, and then the next question that we have is, uh, the Catskill Mountain Corporation allows for paying for septic replacement. Is this available in the Rondo watershed area? And I think Laura's typing, I see that she's typing an answer in there, but I think it would be helpful if you folks answered it live as well. I can start with that. So unfortunately, that's a New York City DEP program, I believe. And so that um, program is only available for the DEP watershed, the drinking watersheds for them. So the upper portion of the Rondout Creek um, above the Rondout Reservoir, I believe might qualify for that kind of a system where they pay for, for septic replacement. But unfortunately, um, communities that are outside of the drinking watershed for New York City probably don't qualify for those funds. I'm like 99% sure. Okay. 
Okay, any final questions? I don't see any. Laura, do you have um, any questions you'd like to ask the panelists before you turn it over to the next presenters? No, not right now. Thank you very much, Sebastian and Jen. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So I'd like to introduce Andrew Faust, who is a core member of the Rondo Creek Watershed Alliance and also runs the Center for Bioregional Living. Um, and he'll be talking about this is what's so, now what? So you're on, Andrew. Hi, thank you, Laura. Great to be here this evening. Um, so many good points there that I want to add to and build on. Really appreciate um, what Emily was talking about. I want to look at how do we protect and uh, prevent and restore the health of these uh, watersheds. And also, we're going to look at, um, as Tom was saying, you know, how do we really go about putting it to a uh, process by which we make good decisions about what's going on with uh, land use in our areas. And so a lot of great information here that I'll be building on. And in particular, of course, our most recent presenters there from Jen and Sebastian and addressing one of my favorite topics, which is sewage and waste issues. So folks, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. So I find that a, a bit of a step back is often helpful when we think about watersheds. So, you know, astonishing number to me is this number here, 3% of all the water on the planet is considered uh, fresh water. 1% of that water uh, is actually readily available approximately, meaning that about 2% of the 3% is uh, locked up in polar ice caps or inaccessibly deep in the groundwater. All right, next one, please. Thinking about our position in the landscape geographically as a watershed and recognizing that it's a quantifiably measurable framework that we can start to and need to begin to plan in relationship to and the things I like to focus on in particular are food, energy, and addressing waste issues by having better food and energy systems. So our next slide here. So now we're zooming into the Rondau as a sub watershed. This has been a kind of study of mine is thinking about planning from the watershed viewpoint with the idea of a more resilient infrastructure, uh, uh, adaptive mode of addressing many of the problems of the present infrastructure by incrementally, regionally retrofitting what is a um, not very resilient industrial fossil fuel um, kind of dinosaur into becoming something that is actually uh, more green economy. So these are numbers about our watershed. We go next. So this quote is from a United Nations document called uh, Strategy for International Food Security in the UN and the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization within them, basically have clear uh, directives advocating for changing how we farm to be more ecological, less technological. The image is meant to epitomize what they are not advocating, what is often a more high impact way of farming. Next slide. This number we'll find is a pretty widely accepted number. 90% of our food comes from outside of where we live. This in particular comes from a study that I've been looking at because it's right in our neighborhood and it was put out by the University of New Hampshire and it's called uh, Food Solutions. 
and they're looking at how can the six state area, Lower New England, I want to say it's 14.5 uh, million is their number. How can 14.5 million people go food independent? And a really interesting study that then I'm taking data points from and translating into the Rondat watershed. So it's from this study and from many other studies that we'll find 90% of our food comes from outside of where we live. And I'm suggesting um, we need to change that. What's our next, next slide, please? So a lot of words here, it's a way to describe what I see as a transition process that we are as a watershed group participating in a, uh, what we might call visioning work of what does a new economy look like? I think it's important for groups who want to improve quality of life to be able to say, what are we for? What is our solution set? Can we advocate for something that we know is gonna work better than the present system and actually begin to plan for it as a preventative measure? So the image here are what are called green belts, which in places like Copenhagen and Stockholm, they've already begun to address some of these more um, regional development patterns that can be detrimental by creating corridors of what they call agroecotourism, corridors of green growth, uh, rather than simply sort of uh, random suburban sprawl surrounding high density metropolitan areas. Next. Two more minutes, Andrew, then time for questions. All right. So this is some of the issues from the present agricultural system. Groundwater contamination, next. We already have existing water pollution problems that we need to address, 37% of rivers. Next. Uh, we need to adapt farming to be more diverse. Next. Transitioning a farm, addressing unmet demand with local organic food. Next. Use rainwater in farming. Next on contour farming to help with flooding issues, next. Adapting to geology, next. Have more farmers, more gardeners, more producers, next. Become more food independent here. Surprisingly small amount of our area, uh, just about 118,000 acres of our 700,000 acres to feed all the people and all the growth that we might want to have happen within our watershed, full diet, year-round food supply, totally achievable. Next. Creating connectivity of natural areas. Next. Retrofitting places like Ellenville to have compost facilities, to have green job training centers, to have more places that are community centers for people. Next. Uh, full watershed stream corridor planning where we begin to think broadly about where we can recommend uh, continuing development of land and where we want to begin to um, you know, conserve and preserve areas. Next. All the things that can be happening in a stream corridor make them particularly important as a place to plan what happens with land use around. Next. Wildlife corridors. Next. Biodigesters are what I'm trying to get to here. <laughs> so here's a generator that's run off of biogas. Next. After they generate hot water and electricity, you still get good compost. Next. So in Sweden, biogas 25% cheaper the pumping gas, subsidized. Next. In China, 30,000 biogas plants like the one here that treats uh, Greenpoint um, 
you know, in China, we've got 40 million homes that are powered by anaerobic biodigesters. Next. Um, an important part of our green infrastructure, green economy that we're not really talking enough about. Next. Part of the retrofit. Next. As a polisher, living machines, um, intentional wetland wastewater treatment systems are important to be thinking about as something to advocate for by polishing wastewater effluent. Next. Uh, biodigesters are particularly fascinating because they are live anaerobic digesters. So they've been shown to cut down on fecal coliform by 90 plus percent. Um, that is a remarkable number to think about as part of a, a set of technologies that are appropriate that we could advocate for to potentially be uh, installed in situations where we find these failing septic or inadequately sized septic systems. And as a perk, as a side benefit, if we integrate things like solar thermal hot water into the foundation of these, if we integrate some farm waste. I mean, it's interesting that in the human sewage systems in this country, can, uh, next, we, uh, sorry, uh, go back to that one. Let's stay on that one. Can you go, yeah, uh, yeah, thank you, sorry. Um, this is really the main thing I want to talk about tonight, and I'll wrap up on this. So just a few moments. Um, you know, what's particularly interesting about this is that we know in this country, the EPA advocates for these as a way to deal with manure slurry pits at dairy operations who are in non-compliance. Yet in the residential sector, we still really aren't seeing much application of it. Whereas clear evidence in China is that when we combine these with household waste streams and some farm waste, uh, you get a very high energy yield to where they're actually running their entire home off of this. So I think it has some exciting opportunities as an appropriate technology that could become part of what we advocate for in the Rondout watershed, along with these ideas of food that I'm suggesting can be incorporated into, you know, reforestation and other work that we all know needs to happen. Thank you. That's what I have. We have questions? I'm not seeing any open questions right now. So maybe Laura can also <clears throat> pop in here. Wait. Oh, we just actually got two, so I can read these. Um, yeah, Laura, do you want to pop in here too? Because I feel like we'll probably go like right from the end of questions into your portion. Sure. Um, so one question is, are there any septic scale biodigesters in the region or in the United States? There are, but they are simply pilot programs right now. What they're particularly interesting for too that I wanna mention in the question section here is um, we can, uh, apropos the discussion tonight, I wanted to talk about how they can be used for septic or for human sewage. Also worth recognizing that we have a, a huge volume of organics that need to be gotten out of the waste stream. You know, I mean, it's easily 48% to 60% of what ends up in landfills, the compostable materials, right? That could be sent to an anaerobic digester. There's lots of examples of that. So the one that I'm showing slides of in this is actually for Magic Hat Brewery in Vermont and they are using it there so that they can uh, stay in order with what the South Burlington sewage treatment plant will accept from them. So they, they get an energy yield from it, they get hot water from it. It's already been approved. So short answer is many of them have been approved for things like brewery waste or uh, cow manure, but human sewage, what we do have are examples like Newtown Creek sewage treatment plant. So we have municipal scale. Interestingly, again, to just quickly, the technology here is there's a lot around it, but the sewage treatment plants use them primarily to reduce the volume of sludge because what anaerobic digesters do 
is break down biosolids so effectively that they reduce volume by tenfold, it's estimated. So the reason why the Greenpoint sewage treatment plant, which is the largest sewage treatment plant in the entire country and responsible for 10% of all the combined sewer overflow events that happen in New York City, uh, happen at Greenpoint. That facility uses them to reduce how much money they have to spend having sludge hauled off site. Wow. Um, for the sake of time, I think we're going to turn it over to Laura um, for hey, thanks, folks. some some updates. Andrew, there is a question in the Q and A box um, that's a little bit longer from John. So if you could if you could take a I'll look, take a look at it. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you so much. And Laura, we'll turn it over to you to close things out. Thank you. So um, you could go to the next slide, the first page of the the brochure. Thanks. Um, so uh, the Roger Creek Watershed Alliance took on a labor of love called our brochure. And um, so I just wanted to just review it with you. Um, it took more than a village to get this done. Um, and uh, so this is basically, you know, one, one of the sides of it. Um, we found this great quote, quote from John Burroughs that we put in there. And um, you could go to the next slide. Um, the Rhonda Creek Watershed Alliance is a labor of love as well. So, you know, everything goes from there. Um, we were able to include a lot of information, which is amazing for, you know, just a, a brochure on the watershed, um, the non tidal portion of the Rhonda Creek Watershed, and the title Rhonda Creek. Um, if you find a copy of it, there's a copy of it on our website and also. I think Rebecca, it's on our Facebook page, um, I believe as well. Um, and um, uh, so it sort of gives, you know, what this what this creek really is and the importance of every single part of it and the habitats um, that are that we have as well. Um, next slide. Oh, there it is. And then, um, you know, lots of different activities that we've done. There's one on here with, that we did with Riverkeeper. With the, the, these are uh, Rondout Valley High School students who helped us do um, we, uh, Riverkeeper. Well, we, no, it wasn't this week. We just did a whole Creek Week event with all the different watersheds on the, the non-tidal portion below the reservoir. And so this was part of it where they went down to do any cleanup that, that, that we could do. They put in it uh, what was then Epworth, which is now uh, the animal sanctuary. And um, as we were also doing WAVE, um, which is through, through the DEC, where we're looking at the microorganisms and the critters and creatures to see about water quality and doing water testing at the same time. Um, so that was actually really fun. I think uh, that this part of this is part of it. Um, next slide is um, and then uh, the last thing is is that you know this is this is our watershed in in the Rhonda Creek Watershed Alliance here. Um, what we decided to do as we were nearing the end is to include as many Native American names as we could on um, the brochure. They're in red um, and. Uh, we're working on slowly a project to get as many Native American names as we can onto an interactive map, um, which was successfully done in Maine. Um, it's really complex because one person's, you know, we have some names and the translations, and then they may or may not be accurate according to somebody else. But the whole point of this project was to have people understand that like the Lenape um, and the, the Muncie named places for their uses. So uh, the more we, information that we could possibly gather um, will allow people to see that it's not just a creek that you can build on because it's pretty, but you know, it had a use like um, the one portion of the Rondet is called the Cahoxink um, and that's where the wild geese fl uh, fly. Um, there's another thing, the place where we meet for prayers. Um, so there's, you know, meaning to the words that have something to do with, with a section or a small section of, of the creek and the area. And, you know, given the 
influx of people that are coming, it's it's a way to have them start to get a, a sense of place um, for the Rondout. So more on that. And um, you know, on that note, I want to thank everybody for attending. This is recorded, and um, we'll be putting it up on our website, and also we'll be sending it out, and it'll probably go up on our Facebook page as well, right, Rebecca? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> thank you so much, Laura, and thanks for everybody for tuning in tonight. Uh, it's great to see everybody here. Um, special thanks too to Monica Dietrich and to Katie Luong for helping to pull the webinar together tonight and to Jen Benson for joining us to help with questions. Uh, the Rondell Creek Watershed Alliance meets on the third Wednesday of every month through November. Uh, and you can find out more by visiting www.rondellcreekwatershedalliance.org. So thank you so much and good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.